Hi, I'm Tara Short, founder and director of Green Adventures, and I'm here to tell you about the upcoming Sea of Cortez trip with the Seacoast Science Center. And um, I have three main objectives. Uh, one is to introduce you to the people that will be facilitating this amazing experience. Uh, two, um, to show you how great uh, the Sea of Cortez is. And three, to um, give you some information on how to register for the upcoming trip in October. So I'm going to get right to it and show you some uh, slides and uh, to give you that information. And um, yeah, hope you enjoy. So um, again, my name is Tara Short. I'm the founder and director of Green Adventures. And we provide a week-long educational programs, mainly for uh, high school science teachers and their students, but also for um, a variety of uh, groups, including uh, zoos and aquariums, um, colleges, um, and, uh, and adult programming uh, through universities. So uh, we work with a wide variety of audiences and uh, each is a tailored program that is progressive. So we get people to um, you know, get face to face with really amazing encounters. Uh, the picture you're seeing here is in Baja, but uh, it um, is during spring when the gray whales make their migration. But Green Adventures really is a facilitator of fascination. We wanna give people um, amazing wildlife encounters that inspire them to be active environmental citizens. And the Seacoast Science Center is in, um, basically ocean education is what we do, is their theme. And uh, that's why our missions work so well together, because um, uh, no matter where you are, you're upstream from an ocean. And Green Adventures has trips in Alaska, Baja, Mexico, Sea of Cortez, and Costa Rica. And all of them have ocean-based uh, programming that helps people um, not only make a connection to the place, but learn about how they can help protect that place from uh, specifically the ocean from their hometowns. Now, the Seacoast Science Center uh, contact for the trip is Henry Burke, and you can see that has e I have his email there and his phone number, um, and then my information is here as well. You can always go to greenadventures.com and click on contact us. So I'm Tara. Short founder and director of Green Adventures. I started this business in 2008, and my goal was to help uh, science teachers bridge classroom concepts with real world um, experiences, and uh, also to just in, in facilitate wonder uh, for students to help them uh, learn to ask questions and be intrigued by the environment. And uh, we have, as I mentioned before, um, progressed from doing student-based programming to educational programs too. So uh, Green Adventures, uh, uh, sustainable eco-adventures that um, help protect people, places, and ecosystems. All right, so I wouldn't be able to introduce about 100 people a year to the Sea of Cortez without Fun Baja. Uh, these people are my partners in crime, and uh, and um, they're like family to me. Uh, actually, who you see there to the left is Chabelo Castillo. Um, uh, he and I have been working together since uh, our first trips in 2009, and uh, we, ma we make a dynamic duo. And I love this picture of Jacques Cousteau, who named the Sea of Cortez the world's aquarium. That's why he has this, this we have the statue of him uh, on the Malecon, uh, because as a kid, I always wanted to be a marine biologist. And the Sea of Cortez allows me to have that experience that I thought marine biologists would have without all the data collection. So let's talk about the Sea of Cortez. It's the world's aquarium, and it is one of the most biologically diverse marine systems in the world. And first, uh, to get an understanding of just how big the Sea of Cortez is, to, to know that it's really not that big at all compared to uh, you know three quarters of our Earth being covered in ocean, it's just a little sliver of uh, a body of water that's nestled between uh, the Baja Peninsula and mainland Mexico. Now about seven million years ago, this peninsula began forming and separating from mainland Mexico. And there's a fault line that's running through uh, uh, the, the Gulf of California, which is a San Andreas fault line. And there's slip fault action. So uh, the, the peninsula is being pushed this way, um, in addition to being pushed farther away from the mainland Mexico due to seafloor spreading. 
And actually, Northern Baja and Southern Baja, um, I'm sorry, Sea of Cortez, are, are relatively different. Uh, in northern uh, Sea of Cortez, you have these sand flats that were created by uh, the Colorado, Colorado River um, when it was depositing all that silt. Um, so it's very, very shallow around here. You have the very high tides, uh, 31 feet difference in tides. It's the third highest in the world. And in the southern um, Sea of Cortez, we have coral reefs um, uh, uh, in addition to the rocky reefs. And that's due to this mixing of the Pacific current coming from the north, equatorial current, and uh, these tides pulling in and uh, pulling water in and out, mixing up the nutrients, creating a perfect oasis for marine life to form. And uh, coral reefs, um, you know, this isn't just a special place that coral reefs are found here in the southern Baja, but also coral reefs on the uh, are found mainly on the eastern sides of land masses in the northern hemisphere, where is uh, on the Pacific side it's usually too cold. So to have uh, reef building corals, uh, that's that's very special. Now notice that this is a desert uh, because the cold water from the, the north is coming south. That cold water, which could be about 65 degrees uh, in the spring and then into winter, can actually um, rob the land of its moisture. So that's why you have uh, a desert on, on land. Now, I told you that it's one of the most biologically um, diverse marine systems in the world, but really, what does that mean? So we're gonna go over, uh, just uh, do a species count. Um, so just think about fish. How many fish species are in the Sea of Cortez, that we, Sea of Cortez that we know about? Either 1,500, 875, or 450 species of fish. So just take a moment to think about that. Make your guess. All right, who thinks 1,500? Not 1,500. Who thinks 875? You're right. If you chose 875, you're, you got that correct. So 875 different species of fish are known to be in the Sea of Cortez. And what's interesting is only 10% 10 10 of those fish can be found only here in the Sea of Cortez. So that, that would be called endemic. So in a comparison, because when we start talking numbers, really what does that mean compared to other places? 1,500 species would be the Great Barrier Reef, which is the most biologically diverse marine system in the world. And then you have 450 species in the Caribbean and the Galapagos, and then 875 in the Sea of Cortez. Now, this is interesting because the Galapagos is actually in competition with the Sea of Cortez in terms of uh, as a destination for tourists. Um, and the Sea of Cortez is known as the Galapagos of North America. So if you really like fish just over the border um, uh, in, it, um, of the United States, you're going to find a lot of them. And um, since many of the places that we explore are marine preserves, when you are diving, whether it be scuba diving or snorkeling, you are surrounded by marine life whether you're in the wake of 100 fins or you're in the wake of just one, it's spectacular and breath and just a breathtaking experience. And uh, who knows what this fish is? Right, it's the whale shark. And this is the largest fish in the world. They can get 60 feet long. Um, and uh, don't worry, they're gentle giants, though. Uh, they're, they're related to the shark because they have a car they're, car they're cartilaginous. Um, but uh, they eat teeny tiny um, things in the water. They eat plankton. Um, and so they're filter feeders. Their throat is only the size of a golf ball. So how many known species of marine mammals can be found in the Sea of Cortez? Now, these are our uh, air-breathing, um, hairy, uh, live-born, uh, warm-blooded cousins. All right, so do, how many of you think there, were, there are eight species, 22 species, or 30-plus species of marine mammals that can be found in the Sea of Cortez? All right, if you chose eight, you're incorrect, sorry. If you chose 22, oh, sorry, wrong again. 30 or more marine mammals come to the Sea of Cortez at some point in their life or live there all year round. Um, and just here's a, um, an example of, uh, you know, a comparison. Eight species in the Galapagos, 22 species in the Mediterranean, and 30 or more in the Sea of Cortez tied with Caribbean. Now, the Sea of Cortez is a relatively smaller surface area than the Caribbean. And I know that I've been in a lot of places in the Caribbean, and I've never seen five species of whales swam with sea lions and snorkeled whale sharks all in the same week. 
has the largest whale um, on earth and also the largest animal on earth. It's the blue whale. These guys can get 100 feet long and their heart is as big as a Volkswagen Beetle car. So if you were to think about snorkeling or diving inside of a whale, you could go through the chambers of its heart. And uh, this is um, a, a, a rare sight, but still um, common in terms of global sightings uh, for being in the Sea of Cortez. So uh, these whales start to make their way into the southern Gulf around uh, April and May and June. Um, and the very first time that I saw a gray whale, I'm sorry, the very first time I saw a blue whale was mind blowing. And they truly are enormous. Uh, whales like this have two blowholes, which you can see from this aerial view. These are uh, um, uh, uh, mysticidae, uh, which is the um, type of cetacean, means that they are baleen whales. And mysticidae whales have two blowholes. So I saw the whale come up uh, to get a breath of air. And then as its head um, kind of went down further into the water and its body trailed behind it, it was like, uh, it kept going and going and going and going and going. And finally, I saw its, its uh, dorsal fin uh, and then its tail fluke, a um, hundred feet long. Absolutely amazing. Now, here's a more common sight, and its name indicates that. This is the common dolphin. It's a long beak common dolphin. There are short beak common dolphins, bottlenose dolphins, Pacific white sided dolphin, and spinner dolphins that we see pretty often right um, near the island and within the Bay of La Paz. And sometimes we even get to, to snorkel with them. Uh, and uh, they provide us with all sorts of um, entertainment. And what you're seeing here is a photo of a, a long nose. A uh, long beak common dolphin who is about to do a head slap, um, which is kind of um, a type of breach. It's a way to communicate or knock parasites off of the, the, the animal. Uh, but uh, this megapod has come together uh, to feed. And you notice there's no other boats off in the horizon, it's just us. And uh, that's one of the great things about um, La Paz as the gateway to the Sea of Cortez is that there's no crowds, there's really only adventure to be had, accessible adventure. And then, of course, there's the largest dolphin, which we tend to see here uh, in uh, late July. These are orca whales. And um, a, there's been a viral video going around, I'm going to show it to you, of an orca whale chasing a dive boat. Let's see if you recognize it. So <clears throat> that was actually from one of our uh, dive boats, a 20-foot dive boat being chased by a killer whale. Uh, but uh, actually more like the, the killer whale is was like playing in the wake of the dive boat. Um, so it's an opportunity that you may uh, get in October. See, of course, it's like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Um, so those of you who like birds, there are over 1,200 species of marine birds and shorebirds. And one of the uh, highlights uh, on the top left here is a blue-footed booby, which is uh, known for its uh, unique mating dance and also its bright blue feet and beak. And then we also have the uh, Pacific cormorant, uh, I'm sorry, the double-breasted cormorant and branch cormorant, which is down here. It's a diving bird that can dive on a single breath 150 feet. And then we have ospreys and uh, black tail. I'm sorry, red-tailed hawks, um, brown pelicans, magnificent frigate birds. And uh, um, just last month, I was um, leading a group uh, to uh, Los Islote sea lion colony, and there was um, a couple of uh, cormorants who were diving down. And, uh, feeding that were um, below us, and the sea lions are chasing the cormorants. Uh, it was so cool to watch these birds diving under us and watching the sea lions nibble on their feet or, and harass them. I'm sure the cormorants didn't appreciate being harassed, but still. Um, and then also there are thousands of species of marine invertebrates from uh, the chocolate chip sea star, uh, I like to say every girl's favorite, to the spiny lobster right here, and uh, um, sea urchins, sea cucumbers, octopus pushes, and then also uh, nudibranchs, which, uh, which literally means naked gill. It is a snail that uh, doesn't have a shell. And um, they come in a variety of colors and there's several different species. 
Um, but by far the most important uh, invertebrate um, are the corals, the reef building corals that I mentioned to you before. And uh, although they aren't as spectacular as the Caribbean corals in the shapes of you know, um, brain coral or elk horn coral or staghorn coral, they're still uh, significant um, and uh, really important to the ecosystem of Southern uh, Sea of Cortez and also to some of the fish populations that, that are commercial fishing uh, populations in, in the Sea of Cortez itself because many of those fish start off their lives uh, on a coral reef because coral reefs provide habitat and food for a lot of those fish. And uh, there's two types of corals. You have the hard corals, which are have a limestone skeleton. Then you have soft corals, like these purple gargonians, uh, that have a, a, a protein skeleton. And uh, there, uh, if you could zoom in, you would see little teeny tiny polyps. And each of those little polyps is a home to one particular one animal of the colony. And they look like uh, small anemones. Um, now, the reason why uh, the, the Sea of Cortez is an ocean oasis and it has so much food it has to deal with the amount of sunlight that it gets annually. And because it's located in the Green Belt, which the Tropic of Cancer to the Tropic of Capricorn, uh, and uh, actually we're right on the Tropic of Cancer is, is where La Paz falls, uh, just a little bit north of it actually. Uh, but uh, um, this, this area gets a lot of sunlight, which is food for plants, right. And those plants, the marine plants, need that sunlight to, uh, to photosynthesize, photosynthesize. They also need lots of nutrients to fertilize them. And so there are these offshore winds that actually will pull the deep, uh, nutrient-rich water from the, the, the basins of uh, the Gulf and bring it up to the surface so that it could be fertilizer for the plankton. And then there's giant plankton blooms, which then in turn is food for fish stocks, uh, whales, uh, and other predators and other marine life. So why is the Gulf of California an ocean oasis in the desert? Mainly has uh, to do with a lot of sunlight and the upwelling of cold nutrient-rich water called, caused by offshore winds, the Sea of California, Costa Rica current, and equatorial current, and those tides I mentioned to you of the 31-foot tide differences uh, that uh, bring uh, um, uh, nutrients in and out of the Gulf. Now, where we're based is out of La Paz, and La Paz is considered the gateway to the Sea of Cortez. So La Paz is um, a, a pretty big city, 200,000 people. Uh, it's the capital city of Baja California Sur, and it's considered one of the safest cities in North America. It does have an international airport uh, that uh, uh, flights from... Uh, Mexico City, uh, if you were coming from the U.S., you would fly to Mexico City and then Mexico City to La Paz. Um, they use direct flights from like Los Angeles along the West Coast, but uh, th those have stopped. So the only way really uh, to go to La Paz Airport would be for you to fly through Mexico City or to fly to Cabo San Lucas, which I'm going to show you in a second, is the most convenient way. But also to know that there are hospitals there for uh, major medical emergencies. Uh, and uh, an Amerimed clinic, uh, so if you need, you know, your prescription or ear, ear infection or uh, just need, you know, to talk to a doctor, those Amerimed clinics are staffed by U.S. doctors. One of the, the quaint, beautiful things about La Paz is it's situated right on the bay, and uh, there's a, a boardwalk along the bay that uh, locals and tourists both uh, will can be found strolling along at sunset when the air gets a lot cooler and, and um, you know the light is less intense. And La Paz is known for its 365 days of beautiful sunsets. It's also very, um, uh, it, it's a um, a modern town with uh, colonial uh, Spanish colonial architecture. This was a mission, the first mission that was built in La Paz in the 1500s, uh, and it's absolutely beautiful to go there on a Sunday or uh, on an Easter holiday. Uh, if you're interested in reading any books about the La Paz and the Sea of Cortez, I recommend John Steinbeck's log from the Sea of Cortez. He talks about being here at this church on Easter Sunday, and he, he talks about the people, and it's, it, it's a true story, and it takes place in the 40s. And uh, like I said, it is a modern town, so it does have the conveniences that most tourists need. And this is the uh, Marina Costa Baja, named after the Costa Baja uh, Resort and Spa that's here. But there's also uh, uh, three-star hotels. Uh, this group would be staying at the Hyatt in La Paz. And um, how do you get there? So for you all, you'd be going um, Boston to... Um, uh, 
to Los Cabos, which the airport code is SJD, and they'd be arriving as a group. And the best time uh, in general for people to go is between the months of July and November because the water temperatures are nice and warm. They're uh, mid, uh, mid 70s to 80s. Uh, when you're there in October, it's going to be in the 80s, and all you'll need is a, a three mil wetsuit. Um, and we do provide wetsuits for you, all your dive gear, um, but uh, just for fishing purposes. So, um, how do you get there? Well, um, you would fly into Cabo San Lucas, and then we drive you up to La Paz. And uh, we usually take a uh, more scenic route through here and end up in um, uh, San Bartolo. When you're like, this is in the mountains, and uh, it's overlooking a man mango plantation. Uh, this community is, uh, is all about mangoes. They make mango candy, they make mango jam. Um, uh, it's a cooperative uh, that pretty much just treats mangoes throughout uh, southern Baja. But we stop there and have lunch at all, um, with empanadas and tamales and uh, um, and burritos, and it's a nice bathroom break. And then we continue up to La Paz. And you'll spend one night here in La Paz as a, a kind of a way to uh, just, you know, uh, catch up after um, your day of travel. And these are the vans that we, uh, Fun Baja owns a transportation company as well. So these are the, the vehicles that will transport our clients to. The next day we get up and we leave La Paz, we go to the dive shop, which is uh, right in this area, and then we take a boat 26 miles out to Espiritu Santo Island, which is really two islands, Espirit, uh, Isla Partida and Isla Espiritu Santo. Um, but uh, it's 26 miles away, and uh, along the, uh, and then uh, we have a variety of vessels that can take groups. Um, this vessel, this is a liveaboard, so that won't be part of your group, but uh, this boat, the Mai Fair Dose, can hold 24 people. This can hold 13 people, down to four people. So most likely, your group would be in one of these two types of vessels. And um, on our on our West Island, uh, um, we'll talk to you about you know things that we see along the way. Um, it's a volcanic island. You'll see a, a a cinder cone, a dormant cinder cone. You'll see volcanic ash that's been compressed, um, uh, and uh, also marine life too. So, oh, actually, just uh, I want to go back, show you something here. Uh, I, this is where the the base camp is located. So we're gonna we'll go through this whole area uh, and then end up here where this is where the camp is located. This is where the sea lions are. Where we do um, we swim with a colony of. 400 wild sea lions. Um, down here in San Gabriel Bay, uh, there's an archaeological site. So um, um, that's just to name a few places. And uh, this is what I was talking about, the compressed ash. Even though it looks like limestone or, or a sandstone, it's a uh, fine ash that has different uh, minerals in it. You have quartz and iron uh, that give it its you know, different hues. And this, this picture just doesn't do it justice. Uh, we might see mobile rays jumping out of the water doing all sorts of acrobatics like the dolphins do. Sometimes we see one, sometimes we see 20. Uh, and uh, these are uh, the smaller cousins to manta rays. Manta rays get 30 feet wingtip to wingtip, and these guys get about 40, uh, sorry, four to six uh, feet wingtip to wingtip. And uh, nobody knows why they're jumping out of the water like that. It could be to, you know, get a good uh, to see what's above them, uh, to knock off parasites, to uh, show um, their, uh, uh, you know, sexual, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, to, sh to compete for mates. Um, so uh, the, the research is still being done. Uh, we also see dolphins that like to bow ride off the front of the boat, and they get so close sometimes you can touch them. And sometimes you see whales like these humpback whales. We also see fin whales that are there year-round. Now, fin whales are the large, are the, the second largest whale in the world and the fastest whale. And there's a uh, um, there's a, a group of them that live in the Sea of Cortez all year round. Um, and what we do after we go out and look, we do our daily activities, we go out every night and look for the big stuff like humpback whales. So let's go back to the island, and uh, this is uh, where the base camp is located. Um, you see that there are tents that are set up. Uh, there's a kitchen and dining area, um, and um, uh, all of the creature comforts you need of home, um, except you're just sleeping in a tent. And there's very few bugs, uh, if any at all. Um, it's literally paradise on an island. And uh, there, um, there are showers and bathrooms down here. So what we do is we bring the bigger boats into the bay into about 10 feet. Then we take a smaller dinghy and we shuttle to the beach. 
and your tents will already be set up. And each of the tents has two cots and sleeping bags and pillows and bath towels, uh, pretty much everything you need to, um, uh, you, you know, to make it four nights on an uninhabited island. Uh, and um, we have fresh water brought up to us. We have electricity, refrigeration, um, and beautiful sunsets that we see every night. And the stars are just absolutely spectacular. Um, if you get up in the middle of the night to, you know, go use the bathroom at like two in the morning, you can see you can see planets and the Milky Way and um, all sorts of celestial um, uh, cycles that you become in tune with. Uh, you'll you'll start to know when to anticipate the moon. You'll you'll start to know when to anticipate the the breeze that picks up every night at ten o'clock. So it's a really great way to connect. It's good for families too, uh, especially, you know, not to sound old, but, uh, or, you know, I guess, yeah, not to sound old, but kids these days, <laughs> they don't know what it's like to be connected with nature. Um, and then uh, also uh, here's a look into the kitchen uh, where the chef is preparing our meals. We can accommodate pretty dietary restriction from gluten-free to vegetarian to um, uh, uh, whatever it is that uh, you know you need your restrictions on we just need to know in advance and this dining area turns into a classroom area at night you see uh, there I am doing a presentation we have a slideshow uh, up on the ceiling here uh, so we have power so you can charge your cameras and then also light so we can you know do do presentations at night and then um, just, you know, the food is, is served gourmet style uh, and, and with love. You can tell that, that our chefs uh, put heart into what they're making and into the presentation. And uh, it's custom that every day for lunch we have fish, but the rest of the meals, breakfast and dinner, are, are kind of a mix between Mexican-American cuisine. We have these beautiful cactus palapas that are um, handmade and uh, um, they are, uh, uh, um, you know, it's made from... Uh, refurbished wood because uh, it's illegal to cut down cacti to make uh, or reclaimed wood. It's illegal to cut down those cacti, especially cardone, to make uh, furniture out of. So these are made, handmade out of cardone that have fallen naturally in the desert. Um, this is uh, obviously the beach and I know some of you are thinking, you know, uh, where do I go to the bathroom? Well, uh, we do have flushing toilets and even though um, uh, they, they aren't uh, you know, regular flushing toilets like you're familiar with at home, they are manually flushing like you would in a marine head on a boat. So uh, you have all the privacy and nobody's digging any holes on the beach. Uh, we also have solar showers. Uh, we use salt water to get wet and the lather up and fresh water to rinse off. Uh, when you're not, um, you know, out snorkeling or uh, hiking, um, you can take advantage of using our paddle boards and kayaks in the bay um, or, or snorkeling if, if it's what you want to do. Um, you have 24-hour access to nature. This is a little anole, um, a lizard, and uh, we have uh, black-tailed jackrabbits. Uh, notice the adaptations here on this, the very long ears and the really long feet. That helps these animals dissipate heat. Uh, easily, um, and uh, these rabbits don't drink water. They only get the water from uh, the plants that they eat, and they're very good at eating cacti and other uh, scrubby uh, bushes in the desert. And then we also have uh, ring-tailed cats that like to come out at night and uh, um, scavenge in our kitchen, or at least look for scraps in the the wash buckets. Uh, but they're um, they they're they're very very cute. Uh, some of the hikes that we do, uh, this one's right behind the camp, very easy to go um, uh, talk about the plants, the ecology, uh, some of the uh, adaptations of desert plants. Uh, this is called a cardone cactus. Um, they can live like 300 years and get 3,000 pounds. Uh, they're endemic only to the Baja Peninsula. Um, they are not saguaro cacti that you're familiar with in Arizona. Or you may be familiar with, um, and it's it's really cool to get close to them. So uh, you know, so people can see how even the folds on the cactus will protect it from the intense heat of the day. Uh, and then also, I mean, even though the desert is sparse, look how beautiful it is and lush it is. Uh, the the desert is is second to rainforest and biodiversity, um, but in terms of biomass, you know, the amount of living, the the weight of uh, living matter per square foot, uh, it's last on the biomes. Uh, rainforest is our first. But uh, when it comes to biodiversity, the niches that these individual plants and animals have uh, that have to be very specialized to survive is, is second to rainforest, and that, and that is uh, pretty amazing.
We will visit an archaeological site that was once a working pearl farm with over 300 people who lived here that were using aquaculture in these tidal channels to raise uh, uh, clams um, that had the pearls in it, and the pearls were sold for jewelry. Uh, even the native people had used those used those pearls to adorn like their clothing and their hair. And then when the Spaniards came here, they you know uh, exploited that from the natives, and then also started harvesting. Uh, uh, these pearls uh, for sale, but then um, also the uh, the clams were used to make buttons um, all over the world. Uh, this is one of three working pearl farms in the world uh, um, at the at the time in the early 1900s, and we will talk to you about its demise as well. So that's a little top side. Now let's see what's under the surface of the water. Um, we have a couple of options. The main, the trip that you will be doing is a trip that is snorkeling based, but you can go scuba diving if you're a certified diver and uh, for an additional fee, or you can discover scuba. So after you've learned uh, some snorkeling skills and you want to try putting the regulator on uh, like this, this lady, uh, her name's Chris, and uh, doing a discover dive like she's about to do. Um, uh, we will take you in and a dive master will basically hold your hand through the whole experience, but you will scuba dive uh, with, with sea lions. Um, but everybody will do a snorkel school and uh, this is a way to make sure that masks are fitting properly, you know how to uh, clear your mask. We teach you how to put your fins on and clear, uh, I'm sorry, and to properly kick. So eventually you are now doing giant strides off the back of the boat so that you can explore a variety of habitats. And we, we will explore coral reefs to rocky reefs and uh, a, a nice video I took while scuba diving actually at Los Islotes Colony. But, um, I just want to show you just how many fish there are. I mean, just even in this few minutes of video, uh, we have um, uh, scissor tails. Those are the little white spots. We have uh, this is a grizzly with the stripes. That's a fabria with those spots. Uh, that's a giant going off to the left. Uh, this is a leopard grouper, king angelfish, barber fish, scuba diver who's having a great time. You just surround it is the quintessential reef community as one should see when they are snorkeling. Now, great scuba diving, but I'm going to show you some pictures after this that really capture, um, you know, what it's like even to snorkel from the surface with this marine life. Uh, this is a surface photo. Uh, I just held my breath and, um, you know, went down maybe five feet, and uh, I'm in a river of grunts. And uh, these guys get their name because they make a grunting noise when they feel threatened by grinding their teeth at the back of their throat, and it makes a grunt, grunt noise. Um, but they will hang out here over rocky reefs during the day, and then at night they head out over the sand flats to, to run around for invertebrates like clams and, and crabs and, um, and uh, other tasty bits. Um, uh, in the open water, we see schooling fish like these king angelfish that um, you know definitely add majesty and color to these rocky reefs. But also, um, uh, what's interesting to know is that usually when they, we do see them in groups, but we also see them in, in mated pairs. And those mated pairs are mated for life. So it, it's kind of fun to think of a fish being monogamous. Uh, having one mate for life. Uh, and uh, angelfish like spicy foods. Uh, they like to eat um, uh, 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 jellyfish and um, sponges, which are hard to digest. These fish are like the garbage men around the reefs, both rocky and rocky reefs and coral reefs. Uh, these are the um, uh, yellowtail surgeon fish, and they get their name because they have these little scalpels near the base of their tail that people call, uh, that's why they call them surgeon fish, because they will cut you if you try to grab one. But they go around eating algae and detritus off of the reef, helping to keep it healthy. But they also add all this, a beautiful color to them as well. And then we have um, triggerfish, like this uh, um, blunt, uh, fine scale triggerfish. And triggerfish get their name because um, when they feel threatened, a little spine pops up near the front of their head that looks like the trigger of a gun. And these are called odd shaped swimmers because the tail, uh, the dorsal, and anal fin move opposite of each other. It makes them look odd as they're swimming over the reef. But the highlight of your water experience will be. The sea lions. Uh, there's uh, it's a colony of 400 wild sea lions that have been 
that have had people visiting visiting them for 15 years and these guys are so curious about divers and this picture actually gives you a good look at why these sea how sea lions are different from seals uh, sea lions have little external ears where seals do not have this little external ear coming out. Also, sea lions will walk around on their pec all four of their pectoral fins, whereas uh, seals do not do that. Um, another thing about sea lions is they have these very sensitive whiskers that they use um, to uh, explore and to, um, uh, uh, to, to, uh, I'm trying to think, to explore and just to, you know, be curious uh, about their world. And um, they will also like to, they'll nibble on you too. Um, and uh, they like to climb on your back and sometimes they'll try to steal your snorkel. Um, but they also will um, let you give them hugs. Uh, and sometimes they'll even, let, they'll even give you kisses. Isn't this amazing? These are wild sea lions. Um, and nobody feeds them. They are just genuinely interested uh, in, in the people that come to uh, the island to dive with them. Now, uh, the picture I showed you were surface uh, snorkeling. Uh, you can also scuba dive with them, and they do interact with divers uh, as, as like they do with um, snorkelers. But here's a little video for you to, to watch um, and see uh, some of these juveniles. These guys were like uh, between one. I would imagine that the bigger ones are closer to three. Um, uh, are going to be thinking about, but they're still curious uh, and want to interact with bubbles and neoprene wetsuit. Uh, and then what I want you to notice is on the last few minutes is a big bull. These guys are like um, eight or nine years old, uh, 1,200 pounds, and they have a harem that they take care of. Um, and usually they'll pass right by you um, going, Ugh! Or as they uh, uh, are holding their territory, they don't care at all. Um, they're so used to dive. Now the sea lion colony is pretty loud. Uh, you know, you have the males who are going by, uh, going, or, or, or. And then you have females who are calling to their babies, oh! uh, and you have babies who are going. Eah! So imagine 400 of that uh, loud ruckus going on at the rookery. Uh, it's definitely sensory overload. And finally, um, which in October, we have a very good chance of you getting in the water with the largest fish in the, in the world that I alluded to at the beginning of uh, this presentation, the whale shark. And remember, these are gentle giants. Their throats are the size of a golf ball. And uh, the ones that are in the bay are about 15 feet long in about 15 to 20 feet of water. Uh, and they're just cruising along eating. Um, and this is a picture of me uh, swimming alongside of one. Um, it's you're not allowed to scuba dive with them. One, because it's not deep enough. Two, because uh, the, the whale sharks are protected and they don't want people trying to ride them or grab a hold of them. Uh, basically, you swim along as long as you can and then you let the whale shark head off on his or her own. And what's interesting is whale sharks are, um, uh, their spots are unique to that particular animal. So that's how whale shark researchers can keep track of the different uh, individuals that are coming into the bay. But now we're starting to find tags on the dorsal fin. And when we see those tags, we report them and, uh, um, and, and help the researchers keep record. And lastly, this is a, a video I took of uh, just knowing with a whale shark, uh, Simon, late June, early July. There was a ton of plankton in the water. Uh, and just uh, swimming alongside of it, and just they're so beautiful. You get to see their gills moving, the look into its eyes, uh, and uh, just you know get a feel of how big it actually is. Um, even a 15 foot uh, whale shark, I couldn't imagine a 60 foot whale shark. And you're gonna see in a second, the tail is like six feet tall. And then uh, this last clip is um, when I spent some time um, with some whale sharks that were feeding. And, uh, um, you know, they let us get so close. I just watched them. Like, they look like a carp, uh, um, you know, uh, feeding off the surface. But then this other whale shark came out of nowhere and scared the bejesus out of me. Um, so uh, we had a good laugh about that. 
All right, so does this seem like something you'd want to do? Um, I kind of touch, I try to touch on some of the highlights of the Sia Cortez. Um, your trip is a combination of, I think I mentioned this already, um, two nights in a hotel in La Paz, um, so you can add some cult, a cultural component. Um, four nights camping out on a spiritual Santo Island with snorkeling, kayaking, paddle boarding, and scuba diving if you'd like. The scuba diving is an additional fee. And then also one night in uh, Toto Santos, which is on the Pacific coast. So you'll get a chance to see both the Gulf side and the Pacific side, and you'll get a chance to live on an uninhabited island in the Sea of Cortez for four nights. It's truly an exclusive experience. And uh, just like it says here, find out why Jacques Cousteau called the Sea of Cortez the world's aquarium. You have to go on this trip. Um, it is life changing. Now, uh, if you want to sign up, um, you just want to show you go to the Seaco Science Center webpage, click on programs, it'll take you to this page. You can click to register and uh, you can talk to Henry. Uh, you can email him. Uh, here is his phone number um, and uh, the details it's $2,700 per person plus airfare and gratuity. Airfare is going to be about $650. Uh, gratuity is about $100 a person. Um, May 15th, uh, you have a $500 deposit if you want to do this. July 15th and September 15th uh, are your two payments of the uh, balance. And uh, there are discounts for kids, so please contact Henry to see uh, what those discounts are so that uh, you can take advantage of them. Okay? You can always email me at Tara at GreenAdventures.com. That's G R E E N. E like in education, D V E N T U R E S dot com, or you can call toll free 888 622 4911. So, um, I want to stop sharing my screen here and go back to. Uh, like just to let you know, I really appreciate you spending the uh, time um, listening to the presentation, and uh, hopefully, my love for the Sea of Cortez has come out uh, in this presentation. And if you have any questions, like I said, feel free to give me a call. Um, again, that's eight 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 six two two four nine one one, or email Tara at greenadventures dot com. That's adventures with any hope to see you in Baja in October oh and also please do share this video with people you think that might be interested in attending the trip um, and uh, hopefully we can make the trip a success for Seacoast Science Center thanks and have a great day